talked last lecture about integral pairs. Uh, and the point of that was that was something we needed in order to set up the appropriate uh, theory, which I said was Hilbert spaces, in order to talk about uh, something like an analog of bases in an appropriate infinite dimensional sense for function spaces. Okay, so that's what this is for. Uh, so I define an integral pair um, to be, well, I defined it to be a continuous linear map from that space of functions on a compact Hausdorff space to R, satisfying some positivity requirements. And then uh, I think it was Alex observed that this condition here, this positivity condition, um, actually gives you that this is uniformly continuous for free, so we might as well drop the continuity. And the reason it was there is that uh, I, I restricted this definition from the situation of X locally compact, in which case, so for X locally compact, well, uniform continuity doesn't even make any sense because this is a topological space, but it doesn't have a metric. And the restriction of positivity plus linearity is not enough to force that map to be continuous in the case where X is locally compact. So I'll, I'll put something about locally compact spaces into exercises later. I decided to focus on the compact case to begin with. Um, anyway, so we can drop the continuity. Yeah? Uh, yeah, that's true, but the other way is clear because if f was identically zero, the integral would have to be zero. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's what an integral is. And the uh, example was the interval with the Riemann integral of continuous functions that satisfied these hypotheses. And then at the end of the lecture, I explained how to take an integral pair, a pair of integral pairs, and construct a new one, which was the product. And then I explained how basically there's a Fubini's theorem which allows you to write this as either integration over x after integration over y, or integration over y after integration over x. All right, so that result compared, combined with this example tells us that we have an integral pair any product of intervals. Uh, I want my spaces to be non-empty, so I want intervals that aren't, well, okay, that's slightly different mark. So I want x to be non-empty, but I also don't want these to be points, okay? So that should be a strict inequality. <coughs> okay, so that product of intervals, that's a compact space, and then I have, I can put these in any order I like by this Fubini result. So there's a sort of canonical integral over the product of intervals, uh, which satisfies the axioms. Well, I started off the discussion last lecture by talking about, rather than intervals, talking about S1. Right? So what is the natural way to, equipped, to equip S1 with <coughs> such a function? Well, I actually implicitly described this last lecture. S1 is a quotient, and I told you how to put the, an integral on a quotient of anything on which you know an integral. Right? So. You might notice I keep changing my mind about what S1 is. <laughs> so it's whatever makes it convenient for what I'm doing. Um, that's not really a sin, as I'll explain in a moment. I mean, they're all homeomorphic, so I can move things around. And once I know how to do that, then I shouldn't be afraid of changing my mind. Okay. But you have to be a little careful, because this integral here depends on the choice of what you think about S1. Okay, I'll explain in a second, but think about the fact that integrating the constant function, that came up net last lecture, integrating the constant function 1 in this case would give me b minus a. Well, every pair of intervals are homeomorphic, right? a, b is homeomorphic to 0, 1. You know that, but if I take the integral a, b on here and move it over here using this homeomorphism, it'll say the length of this interval is b minus a. 
right? So you've got to be a little careful, even though the topological spaces are homeomorphic, that doesn't mean that integral pairs are all the same if you fix an interval. There's more than one integral, integral pair with the same underlying topological space. Okay. All right, anyway, so I'm allowed to fix this to be my choice of S1. And then how do I define this functional? Well, I've got the quotient map from 0. Well, you see why I choose 2 pi, right? So that the length of the circle is going to be 2 pi when I integrate 1. So that's good. Uh, so that's the quotient map. And composing with that gives me a map like this. Then I can use my functional there, and this this here is just uh, post composition with rho. Okay, so it's easy to check that post composition with something is linear, so that's a linear map, and then I just need to check the positivity constraints, but they're they're obvious, right? Because so what's the formula for this? Maybe I should make a definition. So definition. The integral over S1 is defined to be this map. So that's the integral over 2 pi composed with, yeah. let's call this R for restriction. Okay. Anyway, it's that map. Okay. So by definition, then, the integral over S1 of a function, if f is a continuous function from S1 to R, its integral is, by definition, the integral over 2 pi of the function, which just comes from thinking about this as instead of a function on S1 as a periodic function on R and restricting it to 0 to 2 pi. So that's f circle rho. So that's there. Okay, so that's by definition. So let's see why it satisfies the hypotheses. Well, suppose my original function f was non-negative. Well, then f circle rho must also be non-negative. So by the fact that the Riemann integral gives you an integral pair, that integral is non-negative. If I had a function on the circle which was non-negative, whose integral was 0, then the function f circle rho would be 0 on the interval, and therefore 0 everywhere on the interval, and therefore f must have been 0 on the circle. So uh, that's an integral pair. And the same argument I just gave, as you can see, it has nothing to do with the circle in particular or the interval. That argument shows you that you take any integral pair and you take an equivalence relation, the induced thing is an integral pair. Okay, any questions about that? That's right. Yeah. I'm saying that I'm just confused because we want to take an f from S1 to R. Yeah. <coughs> so maybe think about it like this. So there's my circle. Here's a real valued function on it. So let's choose that to be. So if I'm, if I'm thinking about the circle as a quotient, in particular, I'm picking the point, which is going to be the image of the two endpoints of the interval. So let's call that that point there. And then I've got some real valued function, which I'm graphing on the circle. Well, just unravel that. So that's 2 pi. That's 0. That's right. Those are both going to that point and just pull back that function along that. And what if I'm going? Well, you get the idea, right? So this is f, and that's f circle rho, and then just integrate that guy. That's all I did. Yeah. Okay. Well, as you can see, there's more than one way of doing that, right? Because I, I didn't have to choose two pi. That's all right. There's more than one measure on a on a space. That's the same problem. Um, but 2 pi is a natural one. <laughs> All right. <coughs> OK.
Okay, so here's. Well, so that's it for setting up the basic notion of integral pair. Uh, so we know how to construct new examples from products, from quotients, disjoint unions. I outlined briefly last time. Well, that means in particular you can make an integral pair out of any finite CW complex, right? Because those are all constructed from finite sets of points by disjoint unions and quotients. Okay. So any finite CW complex can be non-canonically equipped with an integral to make it an integral pair. So that gives us plenty of uh, examples of those, well, of integral pairs, which go beyond just products of intervals or, or circles. OK, so now we want to use this to set up Banach spaces and then Hilbert spaces. And conceptually, the following exercise is extremely important in that regard. Okay, so let X be compact Hausdorff. Then I can look at this space. Well, it's a space in many senses. It's a metric space, it's a topological space, it's a vector space. For the moment, let's think about it as a vector space. Okay, well, what is its dimension? Well, that's some cardinal, right? I don't care about infinite cardinals, but let's just ask the question about is it finite or not? Okay, so that's finite if and only if x is a finite set of points. <laughs> well, since it's Hausdorff, is it, if it's a finite set of points, it must necessarily have the discrete topology. Okay, so that space is finite dimensional if and only if x is a finite set with a discrete topology. And in that case, right, as we've calculated, if you take a finite set with the discrete topology and calculate this space, it's homeomorphic to r to the n. All right, so what does that say? It says that the theory of finite dimensional vector spaces sits inside the world of function spaces as precisely the finite dimensional examples. All right, so everything we know about finite dimensional vector spaces, the metrics, the topology, the structure of topological vector spaces, we can ask, does this have a natural generalization to the world of infinite dimensional function spaces? That is where x is actually interesting. And I outlined that sort of idea in the context of computing coefficients in a basis at the beginning of last lecture when I talked about Gram, Schmidt, and so on. Okay, but now what I want to do is, is elaborate on that a bit more. Okay, so incidentally, so take this guy with the discrete topology, that's compact and Hausdorff. I could ask for an integral pair. Well, what am I going to do? There's only one thing I can do, almost only one thing I can do. So what's, what's this? That's just a finite, that's just n real numbers, right, attached to each i. What are, I've only got one thing, which is just to sum over all the points and evaluate f at the point and add them all up. Okay. And if you think about it, it's clearly linear and clearly satisfies those conditions. So this is uh, an integral pair. And there's another exercise that shows you that basically that's it. Okay. All right. So. That means that not only does this example, which gives you Rn, <laughs> fit into the world of function spaces, it actually fits into the world of integral pairs also. All right. Well, let me start. Let me start in the finite dimensional case. Okay, so remember when we discussed metrics on Rn, well, we didn't just discuss one. Well, there's one obvious one, which we've called D2, which is the Euclidean distance. 
but then there was at least D1 and D infinity we also discussed. But no big deal, right? Because they're all Lipschitz equivalents that equivalent, they all gave rise to the same topology. So they weren't really any different. They were just conveniences. We could switch between whichever one seemed suitable for whatever we were doing. Okay, so. So remember D1, so I'm feeding in two functions defined on x. x is just a finite set. So this was the sum of fi minus gi, and that was D2. Okay, and then D infinity spend a lot of time thinking about okay well we didn't discuss any others but secretly there's no reason I mean look at this formula on the right hand side I squared and I took a square root there's no reason that has to be an integer that could be any real number right so take P to be a real number greater than or equal to 1 and then there's a DP So those are all metrics, and they're all Lipschitz equivalent. Okay, so I've got one metric for every p between 1 and infinity inclusive, if you like. Right, that's this guy. Uh, they're related. If you take the limit as p goes to infinity, you'll see that these numbers for fixed f and g converge to this one. So they sort of fit into a, a family in a proper sense. Okay. Uh, but those are all the same. That is Lipschitz equivalent. Well, as I discussed last time, provided we've equipped x with an integral pair, we can make sense of all these formulas even if x is not a finite set. write down 1, 2, and p, I'll just do p. So now two functions real valued on x. I can take f minus g to the p. That's a continuous real valued function on x, so I'm allowed to feed it into my integral pair and get a number. And well, that absolute value to the p is non-negative, so the result is non-negative, so the pth root makes sense. So that's a well-defined number attached to any pair of functions on a compact Hausdorff space with an integral pair. And, well, this one we've looked at and understand. So this is the supremum. Okay, so we know that's a metric. We know the associated topology for that metric is the compact open topology. And moreover, this is complete with respect to this. Okay, so we know... Right, that was good, right? That was the basis of our ability to solve DEs, at least according to Picard. All right, so we like this particular uh, metric. But the problem we discussed last lecture was that this situation, that is this metric, is not enough to really tell us what we really want to know in terms of expressing a continuous function as some infinite series, perhaps, in trigonometric polynomials, right? It wasn't good enough for that. For that, we need integrals. So that's why we're talking about this metric. Uh, and not just this one. Okay, so we know we need integrals. So, all right, we write down this formula. We'll prove in a minute that it's actually a metric. So that means we have metric spaces, one for every p between one and infinity. 
Now, in the case where x is finite, all those metric spaces are equivalent. That is, they're Lipschitz equivalent. So we can ask, you know, does this metric space depend on p? Right, that is, pick two different values of p. Are the resulting metrics Lipschitz equivalent or not? might hope the answer is yes. Not too bad for you. Uh, no. I mean, outside the case where it's finite, uh, you don't expect that to be the case. So I'll give an example in a minute why they're not Lipschitz equivalent. Um, one easy way to see it, and in fact the example will be exactly via this route, is to show that uh, Okay, so we know if we take p to be infinity, that's a complete metric space. But if I take any other p, this is not complete. Okay, so it can't possibly be Lipschitz equivalent because if two metric spaces are if two metrics are Lipschitz equivalent and one of the metric spaces is complete, so is the other one. So that shows you that these can't be Lipschitz equivalent. All right, maybe that's just some technical nonsense. Who cares? Well, the reason why it's not complete is precisely because not every integrable function is continuous. Okay, you might have been wondering about that, right? I mean, I defined the integral, but it only ate continuous functions, right? But you know that the Riemann integral makes sense for many functions which are not continuous. So this is a restricted notion, right? So what happened to all the functions which were integrable uh, but not continuous? Well, here they come back and they cause exactly this problem. Right. So as the example will show. OK. Well, so why, why is this a problem for us? Well, we wanted to take, say, an f in the space of continuous functions from S1 to R. And write f as some series of trigonometric polynomials. Well, this is going to be a limit, right? And if we want to talk about expressions like this, we better hope limits exist. OK, so we need integrals because that's how we're going to get the coefficients in that expansion. They're going to be integrals, so we need those. But we need the resulting space, which involves those integrals, to actually be complete. Otherwise, we've got no chance of talking about series. OK, so as it stands, the fact that this is not a complete metric space dashes any hope of making sense of this via the mechanism I outlined. Uh, but that's OK, because we can take the completion. So. Okay, so what we're going to do, uh, probably we'll get to it today. So associated to any metric space is a new metric space in, which is complete. So remember, complete meant every Cauchy sequence converged. So I start with a metric space. Maybe not every Cauchy sequence has a limit, just like Q doesn't have limits for all its Cauchy sequences. But I can put them in by hand, and that's a new space, and that's the completion. So what I'm going to do is I'll start with this metric space after I've proved it's a metric space. And then we'll define the completion. And then I'll take the completion. And that will be this thing, which is called LP. Uh, P is associated to the, the P in the metric. And this will be an example of what's called a Banach space. And when I take P equals to 2, so L2XR or L2XC, that will be precisely the place where this all makes sense. OK, so that's where we're going. Right, so that was sort of an overview of the rest of the lecture. 
Uh, we'll get into the details now, but are there any questions about the general strategy here? <laughs> Maybe I should say. So what, what happened in this picture to all the integrable functions which aren't continuous? Well, what are the new elements in this space that weren't continuous? They were, so I started with continuous functions. I took some metric, and then I took Cauchy sequences. Right? So it will turn out that these integrable functions which aren't continuous nonetheless can be written as limits of Cauchy sequences of things that are continuous. And that's how an integrable function which is not continuous nonetheless can come to live in this space. Okay. So the first item of business is to prove that this is actually a metric, right? And you can sit down and do that directly, but it's actually more efficient to do it through the notion of a normed space. Okay. So what I'm going to do is define normed spaces. I'll prove that these spaces, CTS, X, R, D, P, are metric spaces associated to a certain normed space, and that will give an easy proof of the fact that they're metric spaces. And, well, the notion of a Banach space is also, to define that, I need to also talk about normed spaces. Okay, so what's a normed space? Well, a normed space is a vector space. It's either over R or C, so it'll let F stand for either of those fields. And... Whichever choice I make, I have some function, which is the absolute value in the case f equals r, and which is the modulus in the case f equals c. Okay. Okay. So a normed space over f is an f vector space. equipped with a function, the norm, which goes from, so that's v, plus a function, which goes from v to r. I mean, I hope it's clear, but this is always r. It doesn't matter what f is, right? The modulus lands in r, not in c. So, OK, so plus a function, which is called the norm, satisfying some hypotheses. The norm is always non-negative. So this is this non-degeneracy condition we've seen a few times already in various contexts, right? So the norm is non-negative and zero if and only if the vector is zero. Uh, if I take the norm of a scalar multiple of a vector, I get the absolute value or modulus of the scalar times the norm. Okay, and then there's a triangle inequality. So, uh, so that's it. So that's a normed, normed space. Okay, so you're familiar with at least two examples of a normed space. So one is Rn with the usual length of a vector, and then I could also take Cn. Okay. So the 
those are normed spaces. So for our purposes, at least the way I've set it up, why do we care about normed spaces? Uh, well, I mean, looking at this example, you can see that any normed space gives rise to a metric space. In these cases, they both give rise to, this gives rise to the D2 metric on Rn, right? If I want to measure the distance between two vectors, I take the norm of their difference. Okay, so that's a general construction. So if I have a normed space, then I get a metric space where I just declare the distance between two vectors to be the norm, that is the length of their difference. And then it's easy from these axioms to see that this satisfies the requirements uh, to be a metric. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to show that those metrics, the DP metrics for P less than infinity, are the associated... <laughs> nothing to do with a p here, right? d is just the metric which is associated to a norm. But if I took, there's a particular norm which I'll write down in a minute, which gives rise to the dp metric, and then I just have to prove that that norm is a norm, and then it will give rise to a metric, and then that's how I'll show this is a metric space. All right. Any questions? Okay, so let's get into the proof of that. Well, I can tell you right now, so a Banach space is a normed space which is complete in the associated metric. worth remarking. So. Okay, so we call D the associated metric. Okay. Okay, so if I give you a norm space, well, I can take the metric associated to it, and then I can take the topology associated to that metric, and that's what I call the associated topology on V. Okay, exercise. Check that the vector space operations are compatible with that topology. That is to say that if I give V the topology that I've just defined, then the addition and scalar multiplication operations are continuous. That is, this is a topological vector space. So fix an integral pair, fix a p. f is either r or c. In the case where it's r, this is the familiar object. Right? Now, what we discussed is that if I take real valued functions, that becomes an r algebra. That is, it's a vector space with the pointwise operations and pointwise scalar multiplication. If I put a c there instead, so I take complex valued functions, well, I can also add them and multiply them by complex numbers. So this is naturally a c vector space in that case. So in either case, this thing here is an f vector space, all right? 
And then I give it the function which is defined by this formula. You take the integral from the integral pair of the power and take the pth root. All right, so claim that that's a norm. Uh, OK, there's a further statement in the notes, which is Holder's inequality, which I'll, I'll do later, I think. So. OK, the only non-trivial part is the triangle inequality, N3. The rest are easy, right, if you think about it. If I put a scalar multiple here, it comes out with a pth power of its absolute value, and then I take the pth root, so it comes out the front. And well, the fact that it's non-negative, so well, the way it's set up by the definition of an integral pair, that number is non-negative and its pth root is non-negative. So that's the first part of n1. And the second part, suppose that was 0. Well, the pth root of something is 0 if and only if the integral itself is 0. But by the definition of an integral pair, that says that's 0, the constant function 0. And that implies that f must have been the 0 function, which is the 0 vector. So that handles n1. Uh, for n2, yeah, maybe I, maybe I should be careful. So. In the case where f is c, this is a complex valued function. So this thing means the continuous function which I obtain by applying f, that gives a complex number. And then I take its modulus. That's a real number. OK, so that's what that means before I integrate it. So it's not that I'm integrating complex valued functions. I get a real valued thing, and then I integrate that. You had a question? Um, what is, so the absolute value signs around f, what is those? Yeah, so that was, so. Uh, Let's stick to the real valued case, perhaps. There's a function which takes an f and gives a new function, which I'm calling absolute value of f. And the absolute value of f is the function whose value at x is the absolute value of the value of f at x. Yep. And well, if you like, that function is the composite of the absolute value function this guy here is from R to R with f, which goes from x to R. So as a composite of continuous functions, this is again continuous. Yep. OK. Um, other questions? Uh, that's right, yeah. Integral pairs always have compact Hausdorff spaces. I mean, much of what I can say, much of, much of what I'm saying generalizes to locally compact if I put a condition on f, namely that it's compactly supported. Uh, but I'll write up the details of that in an exercise at some point. Yeah. But for the moment, it's all compact. OK. Well, as you can see, the lambda, I mean, this is the absolute value. It's the modulus in the complex case. So in any case, the modulus of a product is the product of the modulus, or abstract of absolute value. So that's lambda times f to the p. Now, the integral is linear, so this number comes out the front. All right, and the pth root is multiplicative, so that's just lambda times OK, so we believe the first two. So for N3, I mean, it's kind of, I don't think there's a super slick way of doing it. So there's, there's some little bit of calculus you have to do, no matter how you try and prove these things. 
So I'm not going to go through all the details of the calculus argument because it's like first year calculus. You've got a function, you differentiate it, you find where it's zero, and then you know that's a minimum under some constraints, right? So we've all done that. So just trust me that out of some elementary calculus argument, once you know the right function to do it on, which is maybe non-trivial, n3. Okay, so you need the following two facts. Okay, so remember p is between 1 and infinity, and take a and b to be positive real numbers. <laughs> yeah, that's what you would have thought of, right? Okay, that's a claim. Well, that, I mean, it makes sense, right? That's a function of t. I can ask for its infimum over all positive t's. The claim is that for any a and b positive but fixed, it's actually this product. And how do you do that? Well, you just differentiate this, see where it's equal to 0, and that tells you the minimum. That's basically it. That must be t to power 1b. Thank you, yeah. All right. I mean, working backwards from what you need to prove, it's sort of reasonable you'd find this, but I don't claim I would have thought of it. Oh, sorry. Actually, we don't need both of these because I decided not to prove Holder's inequality, but anyway. so um, Right, so there's another claim. I hope at least it's clear what it means. Okay, so assuming that, let's prove N3. Okay, so we need to show that for any continuous F valued functions on X, that this is the case. Well, Read this inequality for any value of t that says the right-hand side is less than or equal to what's inside there, right? Okay. Let me take the thing I'm trying to put on the left-hand side of the inequality and raise it to the power p. Well, so that's okay, so what happened there? Well, forget about the integral and forget about the pth power. I just use the triangle inequality in R or in C, right? which says that the values of this function must be less than or equal to the sum of the values of those functions for all inputs. Okay. And I know, as I proved last time, that if I have two functions which satisfy this relationship, real valued functions, then their integral satisfies this relationship. Okay. So if this function without the pth power is less than or equal to this function, then the same inequality is true if I take the pth power, and then I can take the integral by this. And that gives me that gives me that. All right, but now I'm looking at this thing there, right? So that's less than or equal to t to the one on p, a. A is that. Uh, I need the integral. Okay, so we apply this inequality, but inside the integral, right? So that says t one on p a to the p plus 1 minus t minus p g to the p. Okay, so I apply that value by value. That tells me a relationship like this, and therefore the integral satisfies a relationship like that. Yeah? Could you write that in terms of like f of t, j of t, and put a t, j, t, f? That was a bit... 
Uh, but it's not a DT. Yeah. <laughs> I see what you mean, though. OK. I'm, I'm sort of refusing by doing it over here, but I'll, I'll kind of do it. Confusing. Anyway, so it's <laughs> I'm stubborn, that's all. OK, well, but those are just, t is just a number. We're going to take an infimum in a second. For now, it's just some fixed number, so I can take it out the front. Uh, this isn't an integral with respect to t. It's just a constant. So that's equal to t to the 1 on p, the integral over x, f to the p. That's good. That's the p norm to the power of p. 1 minus t, 1 minus b. T P P. Uh, I hope this notation is clear. This is the pth power of the p norm. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we got. All right, but that's true for all t's between zero and one. Okay, so I've got some fixed number which is less than or equal to this thing for all t's. Therefore, it's less than or equal to the infimum. Okay, stick that expression inside the infimum. But I know what that expression is, because now I've got my a, which is the pth power of the p norm of f, and my b, which is the, sorry, the a is the p norm of f, b is the p norm of g. So, and there. Uh, OK, I have to worry about the case where those are 0, right? This inequality is only valid if a and b are positive. So strictly speaking, if the fp norm is 0, then it doesn't work. But who cares? Because in that case, f had to be the constant function 0 by what we already proved. So it just degenerates, and it's easy to check. OK, so this is equal then for 2, the right-hand side, which is the p norm of f plus the p norm of g all to the power p. But the pth root is order preserving, so that tells me OK. All right, so there's a bit of a magic trick there, but the rest was reasonable. Uh, and that's it. So we checked all the conditions for a penal. Yeah. Uh, that was from here, so that was here. Yeah, maybe I'll, so star, what did that mean? It meant I took f x, that was my a, plus g x, that was my b, and I read that formula which says that to the power p is less than or equal to t to the 1 minus p f x to the p plus 1 minus t. OK, so that's, that's what I read off from the formula. And then that gives me the inside of the integral. So that's a relationship between two functions of x. And therefore, applying the integral gives me the same inequality. Yeah. All right, so. That's it. We've got a norm, and therefore we have a vector space. That's our definition. That's a DP. Okay, so that shows that the original formula I wrote down for DP, which is clearly what you get by sticking into the norm. Uh, the difference of two vectors, uh, that is a metric. That's a consequence of this calculation. So at least we've got ourselves metric spaces. OK, so that part's done. Next lecture, we'll take the completion, and that will give us the Banach spaces, which are LP. And then that's a Hilbert space for P equals 2. And then next week, we'll axiomatize Hilbert space, so we don't have to 
mean, this is getting complicated, but we can axiomatize it and start the game again. That's what we'll do.